to start with what scripture says. He did not replace Israel. He did not reject Israel. He is not a covenant breaking God. The Jewishness of the gospel is an essential emphasis of the gospel. We say Jesus is Jewish, but most of the time what we really mean is Jesus was Jewish. So what is the hope in the Holy Land? It's Jesus. All right, y'all, we've been plowing through a lot of stuff and I have good news and bad news. The good news is it's gonna get more interesting. The bad news is it's gonna get more informative. So we are gonna cover a lot of history in this session. I'm gonna be talking about Zionism. And if you've paid any attention to the news over the course of the last few years, but particularly since October 7th, you have probably seen this term. And typically it is usually in a headline that, uh, is very controversial. So it can be used as an insult. People these days will call you a Zionist in a negative way. Then you have people that call themselves Zionists in a positive way. And it's a term I think a lot of us maybe aren't even all that familiar with. What is Zionism? What, what, what does being a Zionist even mean? So we're gonna look at what does the Bible say about Zionism. First, we're going to define it. And then we're going to look at what the Bible says about Zionism. And then we're going to look at a really broad history that would go all the way back from Abraham. And then I'm going to warp speed us through modern history to the founding of the state of Israel in 1948 till today. So we're going to cover a lot of ground and get ready to take some notes. So what is Zionism? Zionism is defined as this, the national movement of the Jewish people for a, a return to their ancestral homeland, which is the land of Israel, and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. So essentially it's this, the movement of Jewish people to go back to their ancestral homeland and be in charge of themselves. Not to go back and live underneath someone else, which has really been the case uh, over the last 2000 years, living in what's called the diaspora or the scattered places but to actually go back and have a land where they can live in peace and safety and make their own decisions for themselves and rule and reign over themselves. So there's different kinds of Zionism. There's political Zionism, which is what most people get uh, into talking about when you think about Zionism, but there's religious Zionism where it's not necessarily politically motivated. And we're gonna talk about some of that because our Bible is actually filled with religious Zionism, even into the New Testament. Then there's Christian Zionism. There's obviously Jewish Zionism. In fact, there's even Islamic or Muslim Zionism. They are out there. There's people who are Muslim uh, uh, faithful and they even believe in a uh, homeland for the Jewish people. So it takes a lot of different forms. So Zion in Hebrew is an interesting word. We've been talking about the Bible being a, a book that talks about a particular people in a particular land with a particular purpose and that is universal to redeem the world. So Zion literally in Hebrew means like signpost or an indicator. And most of us, when we've read scripture, especially if you read the Psalms, you see Zion a lot. The Bible talks about uh, a love for Zion or we're, we're going up to Zion. So Zion is a place. You can go to Israel today and you can go to Mount Zion. And it, be, it became known as essentially Jerusalem. And Jerusalem obviously is in Israel, Israel today in the modern nation state, but then also in the kingdom of Israel in biblical times. So you can be a Zionist, you can also be an anti-Zionist. And there's a lot of people that don't believe that the Jewish people should have a right to return to their homeland because they don't believe that it is the Jewish people's ancestral homeland because they don't like to read history books. Sorry, just saying it honestly. So let's go back and see where this came from. We looked at Abraham in Genesis 12. Now we read Genesis 12, three. In Genesis 12, seven, just four verses later, God takes Abraham up to a high point And he basically says this to him, look over all of this land that you see with your eyes. I will give you this land as an inheritance. So Abraham is in what is today modern day Israel. He's in the Northern part of what is called the West Bank or Samaria on a high mountain. And he's looking over and you can see a long way. I've been up there. You can see a long way. You can see everything around it. And God's saying, I'm giving you and your descendants this land as an eternal gift. God owns the land. 
And he's giving it to the Jewish people. We talked about this previously as a place to root down where they can become a people group that is committed and covenanted to him that can be an influence to the nations. God never told the Jewish people to go take over the world. Then he never told them that. He said, go to this land. I'm gonna give you borders in this land. And we're gonna see some scriptures about that. So this gets reiterated to Isaac and to Jacob. God makes these same promises to them. 16 times in Genesis from chapter 12 until Genesis, I think 48, there are specific reiterations of the covenantal promise. And then they typically include a connection to the land. We've been kind of told that even if we love Israel, that, okay, there's a covenant with the Jewish people, they're God's covenantal people, but the land, where is that supposed to fit in? Here's why. Going back to what we discussed earlier, we've been brought up in this sort of universal Greek worldview. And even in modern Christianity, most things have become spiritualized. And so we don't really have all of that much of an attachment to terra firma, to like turf, dirt, real on this earth. And so for us, we're talking about heaven all the time. We're singing about heaven all the time. We're singing about going to heaven, right? So there's not a whole lot of purpose for us sometimes as Christians to think, why, why does land really matter? I mean, ultimately I have security and salvation with Jesus and I have a purpose for him. And he moves me from place to place. You know, we move from country to country or city to city, but it is important. Land is mentioned over a thousand times in the Old Testament. It's the fourth most mentioned noun. Now covenant is, scholars would agree, covenant is one of the central factors of the Bible. It's one of the dominant themes. God's a covenant keeping God. 70% of the time that word is used, it is either directly or indirectly related to the land promise. 70% of the time. 63% of that time, the word covenant is used in the Torah itself, the first five books of the Bible. It includes the gift of the land implicitly or explicitly. So what I'm saying is, it's almost impossible to say that you can talk about covenant without talking about the place. You have the people and the people need a place. And if we rewind even further, you remember we talked about Genesis 1. What was God doing? He was attempting to establish an earthly kingdom. There wasn't a heavenly and an earthly kingdom. There was a separation at that point that he had made, right? Between the earth and the sky, but it was all his. And he put people on it and there was no sin. That was his kingdom. And then in Genesis 3, with the fall of man and sin entering into the world, there becomes essentially a war between two kingdoms. God wanted to give his people land where they could be established. Genesis 15 says this, God says seven times, I will, 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 to Abraham. He's saying, look, these are unconditional promises. I will bless you. I will make you into a, a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. And one of the things he says, I will do, is I will give you the land of Canaan at the time. Unconditional promise. God says, you don't have to do anything. This is my gift to you. All you have to do is receive. It has nothing to do with Abraham's obedience or disobedience. It's totally unconditional. And this is something that we need to keep in mind when we think about this, because I think sometimes we get a little bit hung up on, well, but if they're not in obedience to God, then why would they still be able to live in the land? Like, wouldn't God take away the gift that he gave? And we're going to talk about that. So we know that nations are in God's heart. God wants nations and he made a nation for the Jewish people with borders. We know this because in Acts 17, 26, Paul actually says God was the one who determined nations and their boundaries. So this is carried over the idea of nations. And we just need to let that sort of sit on us in the modern day, because I don't think sometimes we think about that, you know, borders and it's all political. And we don't want to talk about it. And it's such a big mess. So I wanna introduce a way of looking at this that I think is gonna be helpful for all of us. The idea of the promise of the land versus the possession of the land. So when God made the promise to Abraham, it was unconditional. But in Deuteronomy 4, God begins to tell Moses, okay, you're gonna go into the land that I'm giving you as a people. You're now really a people before me, a nation before me. You're gonna have certain uh, covenantal outlying boundaries that, that, that determine what makes you distinct from the nations. You're gonna do these things and not those things. And if you do that, you can possess the land. So the, I, the, the point of he promised the land, can they possess it? And this is when you get into this cycle where a lot of people like to say, yeah, but they, they weren't obedient to God. So he kicked them out. And there was these, there's three distinct exiles. There was the Assyrian exile, the Babylonian exile and the Roman exile. And that did happen. 
God said, look, you, hadn't, you didn't own up to your end of the deal. So you are not able to possess the land, but it's, it's still mine. And I gave it to your forefathers. So if you repent and turn to me, I will bring you back. And you see that reiterated over and over in the scriptures. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both foretell a return to the land that God gave him. You see it, Isaiah foretells this. Every time that there is a, I'm driving you out, it's almost always with a promise, I will bring you back. Every time. So if God can scatter the Jewish people, only God can regather the Jewish people. Now, a lot of people say, okay, great. Zionism in the Old Testament, the return of the Jewish people to the land, that's an old thing. Jesus comes on the scene. He never said nothing about land. That wasn't important to him. If land was so important, if the Jews need to be in the land and they need to have all these boundaries in, don't you think Jesus would have mentioned it? Well, he did. So one of the things that's happened over history is that when you don't understand Jesus or Paul or Peter as faithful late second temple Jewish men, you completely miss the context of what they're saying. Number one, Jesus wasn't going around yelling and yammering about the land because at that point in time, it was very well understood that they were gonna get the land back, that that was the whole point of them being there, that the land promise was just a given. You know, it's like saying, hey, I'm gonna turn on the game on Sunday night, the Cowboys are gonna play. I don't have to tell you that's a football game. Somebody, you know, outside of America though, might think the Cowboys are gonna play. What are they gonna play? Are they gonna play like Cowboys and Indians and shoot guns and, and whatever? No, we know, right? These are so, Jesus, it was, it was common. They didn't have to make it explicit. It was implicit. But look what he says here. I'm gonna go to the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody knows this scripture. It's sort of, a lot of people like to claim this is when Jesus is like inaugurating the new kingdom of God and he's recasting all the rules and he's trying to show Israel, hey, there's a bigger thing at play here. It's, it's not particular, it's universal. So Jesus says something really interesting in Matthew 5, 5. He says, blessed are the meek, which actually is better translated the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. We all know that scripture, right? The word for earth here is a Greek word that's G-E, G. -E, G. Now, Jesus, interestingly, is directly quoting Psalm 37. This is a Psalm of David five times in the Psalm of David, Psalm 37, he says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. Eretz, Hebrew for land. This word GE now, most scholars are starting to realize it doesn't mean earth, it means land. Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience and he's saying, if you are gentle and you aren't retri retributive in your violence or your justice, then you will inherit the land that God gave you and you will live here in safety. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 13, you are the salt of the earth. Also G-E, G, salt of the land. Then he says, you are the light of the world, the cosmos. Get this picture. Jesus is speaking to Jewish people. He's saying, look, you guys, you're the salt of the land. If you aren't salty with your own people, Israel, you will never be the light of the world. Israel will never shine for the nations if you can't get your act right as a family. So you need to be salt to your family here in the land so that you will have the ability to be light to the world. That's what he's saying. And we miss it because we buried Jesus's Jewishness. Here's another fun one. Most famous prayer of Jesus. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Another way of saying that is make your name great. Give your name a good reputation. Then he says what? Your kingdom come on earth. It's the Greek word G-E. Think about this. Jesus says, let your kingdom come on land as it is in heaven. He's telling the disciples to literally pray, Lord, make your name great and let your kingdom come here. Let it come down from heaven where you exist and reside in concert with where we are on the terra firma. This is one of the parts about understanding Israel that gets me the most excited because I believe, wow, God's interested in the earth I walk on right now. He placed me in the city that I live because he wants me to connect to the place that I'm at. He wants me to be shaped by it. He wants me to shape other people. And that's what he's telling the Jewish people. It's not just some spiritualized reality. It's here right now. This Greek word is used 19 times in the New Testament, G-E. Paul uses it. Jesus uses it numerous times. And it's almost always pointing to the land of Israel. The kingdom of God is a place where God rules and reigns. It's inhabitable. 
It's planted, it can be visited, it can be restored. It's in sync with heaven. This is what Jesus was trying to inaugurate, a kingdom on earth like Genesis 1. So, okay, Jesus said that, but then you get to the book of Acts and everybody knows that the book of Acts is this missionary book where they start in Jerusalem and Peter preaches this message, Jewish people come to faith and then the the gospel kind of moves outward to the nations, right? It ends with Paul in Rome in Acts 28. And most scholars have said there's this centrifugal motion like outward motion of the gospel, where it's moving away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is no longer the locus of salvation. The nations are. Well, upon further look, in Acts 3, 21, Peter is talking to the Jewish community and he basically tells them, you know, Jesus sent, God sent Jesus to you first to turn you from your sins. But he uses an interesting word. He says, until the final restoration of all things. Now this word restoration is a hard word to say in Greek. It's apokatasteso. All right. I'm going to read you a couple of times in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where this same exact word is used. Jeremiah 16, 15. I will bring them apokatasteso back. Jeremiah 24, 6. I will bring them back apokatasteso. Jeremiah 50, 19. I will restore Israel. Hosea 11, 11, I will return apokatasteso them. Peter is literally telling them, Jesus is the Messiah and his whole, the purpose of the Messiah is to restore Israel to the land. And he's quoting an Old Testament concept, a Hebrew scriptures concept to help them understand. So the gospel does go out, but you know, interestingly, there's six times in the book of Acts where people return to Jerusalem. So there was this going out, but it was like Paul kept going back. Even the apostle to the Gentiles, he kept returning to Jerusalem. There was something about Jerusalem. You know, Ezekiel 5, 5, God says, I have set Jerusalem at the center of the nations. Some scriptures say at the heart of the nations. There's something there because it's Zion. This is the place where God is gonna dwell with his presence and Jesus's feet are gonna touch down on this land. And we know that because Revelation talks about it. He's gonna come and he's gonna rule and reign from Jerusalem. Some people, you ask him, do you believe Jesus is coming back? Yes, To where will he come back? I don't know. (laughs) Never thought about that. Will his feet have to hit the ground somewhere, right? To rule and reign on earth. He's gonna come back to Jerusalem, a Jewish Jerusalem. So what happens is the Romans kick the Jewish people out after Jesus departs and ascends. And I won't have time to get into all the history of that, but in AD 135, there's one last Jewish uprising and the Jewish people are kicked out of the land. The Romans are sick and tired of all these Jewish uprisings, which had been happening for a hundred years. And they renamed Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina. They renamed the land of Judea to Syria, Palestinia, which is where the term Palestine comes from. And basically the memory of the Jewish people is erased until the 1800s. So Jewish people escape and they move into the diaspora, into Europe, mostly Christian places, and they keep getting pushed further and further through antisemitism, which Pastor David covered. And you get to this point where they're no longer tolerated in Europe. The 1800s, enlightenment begins to take over, nationalism rises up, and people just aren't really all that great with the fact that you can be both Jewish and German. Because they're like, wait, you're a German in the morning and a Jew in the afternoon. We don't trust you. We don't want you around. So they start chanting, as David said, Jew, go to Palestine. So this happens. Waves of violence break out. Jewish people began to realize, you know what? We pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. We pray Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept and we recalled Jerusalem. And they begin to realize maybe we need to move back to this place that God planted us. And they begin doing so in large numbers. Between 1880 and 1914, Two and a half to three million Jews left the Russian empire. Many of them came and founded the American Jewish community, which at the time in the late 1800s was about 250,000 people max. Many of them went to what was in Palestine, Ottoman Palestine. What were they doing? They were getting away because they had no other place to go. And when they landed there, they found the place largely barren. Most of the land was owned by absentee landowners and they purchased the the land at large prices, sometimes over market. Most of the land that they got was swamp land, was desert land, and they began to reinvest themselves into the land because they thought, this is a gift that God gave us. We wanna take it seriously. 6% of the world's Jewish population was in the land of Israel in 1948 when the state of Israel was founded. Today, it's 44%. 
They didn't have anywhere else to go. There was, they were not colonizing a place. They were getting out of somewhere where they were being killed and chased and hunted down. They were saying, we don't have anywhere else to go. We have to go here. And every time that they were offered a plan on, hey, you can have this land and we're gonna give the Palestinians and the Arabs this much land, they said, absolutely. And the Arabs typically said, no. They didn't wanna live side by side with the Jewish people. So we can't get into too much more of that history, but I will land on this. The modern Jewish people have been regathered. There's so many promises from the prophets about regathering the Jewish people. And the question you have to ask yourself is this, we know God's going to do it at some point. It's very clear. Jesus will rule and reign in Jerusalem amongst his people. So if it's happened now, is it of God? These are weighty questions, but it's hard to say it's not. And if they're living there, one of the big objections people have is this. I get it that God promised them the land. Okay, that's fine. But you know what? Here's the deal. They refused to accept Jesus. That's why God kicked them out in AD 70. And so now they're coming back and you're, you're expecting me to say, yeah, I'm behind that. I want to bless that. They're living in disobedience. These people aren't even in relationship with God. Most of them are secular. They're letting abortion and all these different types of, you know, uh, human rights exist that aren't godly, that aren't in the scripture. We need to remember the promise and the possession, but you need to remember this. I'm gonna read the words of Ezekiel and we're gonna end with this. Wayne mentioned earlier this morning, Ezekiel 36. It was one of the scriptures that really gave the, opened the eyes of him and Pastor Robert and the elders to understand what God was doing. Listen to this. Therefore, give the people of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord. I am bringing you back. Watch this, not because you deserve it. I am doing it to protect or hollow my holy name. Do you see the connection to Matthew 6? On which you brought shame while you were scattered among the nations. I will show you how holy my great name is, the name on which you brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their very eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I'm the Lord. That was the whole point at Shady Grove Church. I want to reach the nations. When Israel knows the Lord, the nations will know the Lord. This is what it says. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is a mystery. So I don't know how to merge all this together, that there's so much sin and godlessness in the, in the modern nation state of Israel. I know this though. God said he was gonna bring them back. And when he brought them back and reestablished them, he is gonna sprinkle clean water on them and he is gonna cleanse them and they will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony and stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I will cleanse you of your filthy behavior. You will be my people and I will be your God and you will live in Israel, the land I gave to your ancestors long ago. So is Zionism complicated? Yes. Is it a lightning rod topic? Absolutely. We're gonna get into later how do we sort this all out with modern injustice and all these competing interests between Palestinians and the right of Palestinians, the right of Jewish people, we're gonna sort all that out. But we have to, again, come back to scripture and say, God, what are you doing? Show us, open our eyes to see what you're doing. Israel's not perfect, but God has a plan to restore them. And we believe he's doing it today.